think I'm going to like this Thank you. Yeah. Welcome to, to the Department of Computing Information Systems seminar series. Our uh, speaker today is Professor Kenton O'Hara. Kenton works in the, uh, in the Social Digital Systems Group at Microsoft Research Labs in Cambridge, UK. He's a visiting professor at uh, the Computer Science Department at the University of Bristol. But he's also a, a principal researcher in, um, in the newly established Microsoft Centre for Social Newy here at the University of Melbourne. Um, so it's, we're, we're delighted that we've got but Kenton's chosen to spend a little bit of time with us to continue working on this thing. Before working at Microsoft, uh, Kenton spent some time in, uh, near the beaches of Sydney, working at CSIRO as a, as a principal scientist. Um, He's also spent time as a researcher at Xerox Europark, HB Labs, and the Appliance Studio. Uh, Microsoft has many talented and very creative scientists, engineers, and researchers, but not many of them can include, include a British Academy Film Award to their achievements. <laughs> Kenton is a recipient of a BAFTA Award for his contribution to a production called Coast. So that's we won't be talking about that today. <laughs> today, to, maybe we might talk about the BAFTA Awards later on. Today, Kenton's going to speak about his most recent work on um, natural user interfaces, on gestural interaction, and, some, and the use of, um, of technology in, in everyday social purposes. So, please join me in welcoming Kenton. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Um, I see some, a few familiar faces from Oskai here. So some of this talk you might have heard before, not all of it. So there is some new stuff, um, but uh, hopefully there's some new stuff to interest you here. So one of the key trends in uh, recent years has been the emergence of various uh, new forms of interaction techniques. And they kind of, they're intended to draw on some of the ways that we might actually um, interact with, manipulate, and communicate in the everyday physical world. So such techniques um, have opened up uh, our interaction beyond the keyboard to include a rich repertoire of interaction modalities and include things like gesture, body-based interaction, um, natural language, tan tangible computing, pen-based pen computing, and, and so on and so forth. And collectively, these have um, come to be referred to uh, as natural user interfaces. There's something implicit in the terminology here, um, in particular around the notion of natural, uh, and this has implications for the way that we frame our understanding um, and the design and evaluation of, of these technologies. And the essential arguments here are that by drawing on our everyday capabilities for understanding and interacting uh, with the world, we can make our interactions with technology uh, more natural and more intuitive. So the idea then is that these allow us to interact in the way that we're meant to interact and not have to adapt ourselves to the peculiarities and limitations of the technologies. So predominant um, in this new narrative is, is that it, it tends to adopt a representational notion of what naturalness is. So naturalness is seen as something that's uh, existing, it's seen as something that can be is stable and something which is definable. Something which is bound up in the interaction mechanism itself, or, or a particular set of gestures, um, for instance. So the argument here is that the better we're able to sense movement, the better we're able to sense um, a voice uh, or, or touch, uh, and our actions in the environment, the better we're able to represent uh, and model these features in the system. And these then uh, will allow us to communicate or manipulate uh, uh, the environment in much more natural ways. However, in, in adopting this uh, particular stance, so the analytical concerns sort of become focused inwards um, on the interface itself. And issues such as learnability, uh, ease of use, um, with which an individual control can control or learn a system become paramount in the narrative or the ways that we judge these things. So the systems then become judged according to how well they, they uh, achieve these uh, stable and definable notions of naturalness or how well they, they fall short of um, this n hypothetical notion of naturalness. So 
So what I want to talk about today is rather than seeing our bodily action simply as um, an objective and a representable concern, I want to think about an alternative perspective and something that we're, we're thinking about with the, the, the social Nui Centre. And that's really trying to re reframe um, this notion of these new technologies, reframe them as more of a social concern and one that focuses our attention really on the embodied lived experiences with these technologies, how our interactions with these technologies um, and our, our embodied act actions are used to create and construct shared meanings with others in the context of our social interactions. So here then, the, the point about this approach is that it relates to the possibilities and constraints that they present us um, for action and the social construction of shared meaning um, through these actions. Issues such as how our actions are made visible, how they're made uh, accountable and understandable in the broader social context of socially organized um, practice. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about three projects which um, uh, draw on different uh, social contexts and the use of different kinds of new, uh, what we might call new technologies within these different contexts that attempt to sort of illustrate this particular perspective. The first one of these is a bit um, is a bit left field, and, I, and I, th I think it fits within the within the framework of natural user interfaces. Some might uh, argue otherwise, but um, so essentially, what what this this particular project was about was uh, understanding um, some of the ways that we can use brain computer interfaces uh, in in social contexts. Now, the initial motivation for these kinds of systems were to overcome some of the constraints of uh, physical dis disabilities and physical uh, impairments. The idea then was that it, it, it bypassed, uh, bypassed the need for bodily um, action in the control of technological systems. So um, applications such as controlling cursor movement for text entry or uh, controlling uh, motorized wheelchair through um, the sensing of particular brain signals. It was technological advances, um, ver various commercially available systems now have opened up some of the possibilities for more everyday um, applications of brain-computer interfaces beyond these initial motivations. And what captures the kind of imagination about these technologies is the idea that through, through thought control um, and, and the power of the mind that intent can be inferred and acted upon to achieve system control. So much of the research done in this area really has been uh, lab-based and focused, uh, as I say, inwards on the questions of uh, interactional um, efficiency of, of, of these kind of systems, their ability to effectively uh, achieve control of certain system, system behaviours. And while there's been some um, impressive results uh, from, from, from that perspective, um, the very fact that they've achieved any kind of success in, in turning uh, sensing of the of brain activity into um, system control, if we judge them in the context of the, these representational arguments of naturalness, um, then actually they fall, their, their capabilities would fall um, actually very short of the ideal definition. Now, our opportunities for thinking about brain-computer interaction in a, uh, in a social and embodied um, way are actually being limited by uh, some of the practical concerns uh, of the technology. And also, brain-computer interfaces present us with actually with a little bit of a conundrum again if, we think, if we're trying to think about um, embodied uh, approaches to our understanding of these things, because it evokes a kind of brain-body uh, dualism. So focusing on uh, the individual brain um, and, and its attempts to, to bypass the actions um, of the body. But in some senses, one, one of the reasons I want to talk about this is actually I think it, it, it provides some additional impact in the way that we uh, treat these interfaces as an, an embodied um, concern in relation to what is uh, visible and, and not visible in the context of these interactions. So one of the things that's, that's uh, has opened up some possibilities for us to explore these as an embodied and social um, concern has been the recent uh, turn to BCI uh, interfaces in, in gaming. And so we can think about uh, these things then in a, in, a, in a particular social context of use. And the particular game I'm gonna talk about that we did some studies on is this, this one down here, it's called MindFlex. Um, and it's very, uh, basic form of uh, brain-computer interaction. Essentially, it, it does uh, EEG-based measurements and uh, uh, a naive kind of explanation is, is essentially the more you concentrate, the, the, the stronger the signal. And uh, so it, 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 it tends to have um, 
yeah, just measure essentially concentration levels. So if you stop concentrating, uh, it turns the system off. If you if you concentrate more broadly, um, uh, it, it increases the signal that goes to the system. So that, so the way that this game works is is this, you can see there's a little foam ball there. There's a fan in the in the game, and essentially what happens is the concentration levels determine the extent to which the fan blows the ball in the air. So the higher, higher your concentration levels, the higher the ball goes. And yet the idea is that you move then this thing around, this fan around the obstacle course. Um, so you use your uh, brain signals to uh, change the height of the ball, and then you use this, this twisty dial at the front to uh, move it around. So I'm just, I apologize for the quality of these videos. They don't, they don't show it very well, but um, I'm just going to show you uh, uh, an initial um, video that really is, is looking at this issue of uh, intentionality and how things are made visible or not in the context of brain-computer interaction. Oh, very good, sir. make out the ball with kind of What's illustrated, I think, in this in this uh, series of clips here is that the intentionality here, with respect to um, system control, is not simply a functional goal, uh, a functional goal-directed um, issue uh, in the ways that we uh, uh, might control our, our human-machine um, interactions, but it's actually also a concern for how we understand the actions um, of others in socially organised actions. Now, in order to explain this, I want to talk about some of the distinctions here between. Um, interaction manipulations and interaction uh, effects. And I, I think John actually, when he talks about his gaming, also um, uh, makes reference to these, these um, ideas. So here, interaction manipulations are the actions um, that you need to perform in order to realize a system action. The interaction effects are the system uh, behaviors as they're, they're manifest as a consequence of these particular interaction manipulations. Now, one of the things with, with brain-computer interaction, then, is that these uh, uh, interaction manipulations are not visible to those around because they're based around um, the, the, the sensing of the, of the brain signals. Okay, so, the, so in this sense, what you saw um, is difficulties in understanding the intentionalities of the, uh, the, the players, so the people watching, um, trying to instruct uh, the players, for example, how, the, saying, you know, this one's up, this one's up. Um, uh, what, what's going on there is, is, is that actually they're, they're misinterpreting some of the uh, intentionality on the part of the player. Now, one of the reasons why this happens is because normally, I think, in, in, in human-computer interaction, actually that you can compensate for lack of visibility of the interaction manipulations by, um, by a close association with the uh, interaction effects. Now, with uh, BCI and in this particular system, actually, there's a there's a, a poor correspondence between between those. So there's a lack of control precision. So there's a poor mapping between what what you uh, are trying to do through your brain signals and what the actual outcome is. And this then leads to the misinterpretation um, of actions and intentionality on the part um, that the, the audience trying to interpret the behaviour of the player that leads to these misinterpretations. What you also see here is is that there's a social pressure then to or um, to make your intentions and actions uh, visible. So you, you, the, the, uh, you saw um, that people are using gestures, bodily gestures. They don't need to do this from the point of view of control, but in order to make their 
their actions uh, understandable to those around that they, they, they use gestures and they also use verbal explanations um, as a way of explaining what is, what is going on uh, in their head, what they're trying to do. So here's another, another clip. So, I think, so here what, what, what's going on, um, uh, there's a, there's, there's a father-son relationship um, at play here and uh, the concerns here, uh, you can see that he, the, the, the child is using um, his hands uh, to kind of create a, a narrative around this and the, you know, the use of the hands here is not about the pragmatics of control or anything to do with the way that um, uh, brain um, sensing happens. But what's, what the father is doing in the context of the father-son relationship here is trying to construct an additional sense of, of awe and wonder around the uh, actual uh, interactions. And what's important is that the, it's the ambiguities around the way that the, the system is working, or the, the, the fact that the, the son might have a fairly naive understanding of what, what's going on or how the mechanisms are working that, that the father is able to appropriate then in order to create this additional uh, narrative. So the embodied actions then of the son become part of the way that this narrative um, is played out to create a, a much more kind of fantastical experience that goes beyond again the pragmatics of the controls. So the idea is that the energy He's imagining the energy flowing through his hands. That he's some, you know, he's got some sort of magic control um, over this system. and spectators in gaming and I think this also is playing out uh, uh, here so the social context of play is creating opportunities for particular forms of uh, audience uh, engagement. Now what's, what's important here about this particular mechanism is again the ambiguities um, that, that are then appropriated in the enactment of these particular social relations. 
So what, what you saw from, from those uh, clips is how people are orienting to, the, to this kind of um, relationship between the brain activity and system behavior. The idea that the system um, response is somehow a reflection of the, the cognitive uh, state of the player's brain. What's also been appropriated um, is the, the, the lack of visibility and the generalized um, ambiguous nature of the, the, the system. I think there's, there's an additional important thing that's, that's going on here. So, so I don't know whether you picked up, um, uh, because of the accents and stuff like that, whether, whether you picked up on the various references. So the f first one was to, you know, a reference to Hugh Jackman, and that, so the, the son shouts out Hugh Jackman, Hugh Jackman, Hugh Jackman's naked over there. Right? So he's, he's, uh, the mother here has a particular crush on Hugh Jackman. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so, and so the, what's going on here is, and, and, and then the father was also talking, they were also trying to do the, the whole match of the day thing, and the son was talking about uh, him giving up football, and going, using drugs and things like that, so trying to distract his father, using those things. But I think what's interesting is really not just that, not just that they're trying to distract um, uh, or create humor, it's really how they're, they're bringing um, in their, their knowings of, of the, the the mother and the father or whatever, and, and then they're using those knowings as a way of uh, playing them out. So they're, do, they're doing something additional here, which is um, there's, there's various kind of social acts in, in, in the fact that they choose those particular topics, for example, the timings of the way that they, they um, present those back. So it becomes a way of, these become a way of not just of creating humor, but they're acts of uh, what we might call social um, faithfulness, construct through the properties um, of this particular form of interaction. So I'm going to move on now um, to quite a different uh, uh, topic. Oskai attendees, you can leave an email now because um, you'll probably have heard this. So anyway, this, this particular context is uh, really around uh, consideration of the use of gesture and voice in the context of surgery. So surgery nowadays is increasingly reliant on a range of uh, different medical imaging technologies, so things like CRT, MRI, X-ray, and they're used for various things in, in surgical context for, for, for guidance, for reference, um, for diagnosis, and for, for documentation. So there's substantial interaction with uh, imaging uh, displays to capture, browse, and manipulate images during surgery. And what, what's distinctive about these, these settings, uh, and unique about these settings relative to more everyday practices in which you might consider, consider gesture, is um, the fact that they're operating in a sterile environment and, and that there's a need to manage the strict boundaries between sterile and non-sterile by avoiding the transfer of matter between one object uh, and another or between one person and another. Now, with traditional keyboards or mouse-based based activities, obviously there's some contact involved in those particular interaction mechanisms. So the, so the work practices have to be organized uh, uh, in order to uh, av avoid uh, um, touch-based uh, interaction um, by the surgeon. So here the surgeons, when they want to uh, consult images during uh, surgical uh, procedures, is they have a number of uh, different choices. So they either go through a time-consuming process of taking their gloves off, uh, using, using the mouse or keyboard to interact with the images, and then uh, re-scrub and, and get a new set of, of gloves on. Um, or they, as we see here, is that, is that they can um, have a third party who, who can manipulate the, the images on, on their instruction. So, so here the scrub nurse um, is controlling the mouse and uh, the uh, neurosurgeon here is pointing to where he wants her um, to point. Now while, while this kind of third party interaction is okay for, for basic image manipulation tasks or image selection tasks, uh, for more complex interpretive um, use of the images, um, actually the, the cognitive work that gets done and social work that gets done through these images um, uh, is restricted because actually these, these interpretations are, are, are bound up with the dynamics of the manipulations that might be possible. There's some evidence uh, that, that, uh, that, they, that in order to get hands-on control, they uh, use particular workarounds. So here is a radiologist who um, lifts a scan up over his hands in order to be able to have that direct hands-on control and avoid uh, the, the process of having to instruct a third party to manipulate the images. This gives him much more dynamic control over, over these things. 
So we have been using the, the Connect system to develop uh, a touchless way of uh, interacting with these technologies that employs both gesture um, and voice as a way of control, um, manipulating the images in the context of surgery. And the idea here is to think about gesture not uh, as, a, as a natural form of interaction or intuitive form of interaction, but really how it's overcoming these sterile boundaries and allowing people to, to organize their work in different ways. The Connect for Windows technology presents some real opportunities to allow potential solutions. <coughs> Through close collaboration with vascular surgeons and guys at St. Thomas's Hospitals, we have developed a system for manipulating 3D images. The system supports the surgeons to pan, zoom, rotate, lock, mark, and fade the 3D overlay to view the underlying 2D fluoroscopic image. <coughs> we have used voice control for the execution of discrete commands and gesture for the commands that lie upon a continuum and lend themselves to a physical manipulation metaphor. Seamless transitions between gestural commands allow the surgeon to have his attention on the images during manipulation. So uh, I, I'm going to talk about the implications of these things. Like I say, it's this, the, the, the motivation behind using gesture in, the, in this context is not about making these, these uh, manipulations more uh, in, intuitive. Okay. Now, one of the, one of the things, um, one of the challenges when they're, they're communicating to a third party is, that, is actually that, that those operations or those instructions uh, become kind of laborious and cognitively demanding. And the, the, the instructions of the surgeons are normally designed um, in such a way as to to be expressible and understandable by that third party, and that, and, and that, um, what that what that means is that, is that the, the the control of images then becomes um, more about the projection of, of end states rather than about the dynamic uh, manipulation of these images. It's about achieving a particular end state, uh, you know, a particular level of uh, image transparency, a particular level of zoom, for example, rather than um, the dynamic process of of uh, manipulating from one level to another. So I'm just going to show uh, a video of it uh, in use and then we can talk about um, what, what we can see in the video. So here is his, his, there's, a, there's an overlay on top of one of the images here and he's just um, uh, fading in and out. One, one of the things that this direct control has given them then is, is really, um, so, so I mentioned if, if they're doing this through a third party, the, the, that, that particular fade um, control would, would, would be, they'd say something like, can you, can you fade out? And, and the, the third party would just um, go straight to, the, to, the, um, to, to make the overlay uh, disappear essentially. So they would reach that end state. But here what, what you saw was a much more fluid, um, and repeated uh, back and forth uh, going on as the surgeon is inspecting it. So he's inspecting the images dynamically in the context of his uh, manipulation. So it's the ongoing animation of that overlay in relation to the, the underlying um, fluoroscopy image that's allowing him to kind of create that correspondence between those layers in a much richer way than, than uh, would have been possible without that dynamic uh, manipulation if he didn't have that hands-on con control. The other issue is, is that uh, it's, it's also the timing of these things, the, the, these manipulations. So the fact that, so where his gaze uh, is looking either at the, the, the this um, screen on the right hand side, but he's also moving back and forth um, as he's trying to um, combine the, the, the imaging resources together in order to, to create 
um, his interpretation. So the fact, that, the fact that he has that control and is not having to instruct someone to, to control in the context of his um, movements back and forth between the imaging resources and the information resources, again, is, uh, is an important concern here. The, the other thing that you might have noticed, it was, it was quite quiet, but actually what, what he's also doing in the context of those manipulations is, is uh, talking to his colleagues about what, what he's seeing. So the, the, the issues about um, image interpretation is actually it's a, it's a social practice. So they, they are collectively working together in order to come up with interpretations and courses of, of action. So he, he is describing things as he's seeing them and uh, collaborating over those manipulations. So again, having direct control over this allows him to time his manipulations in the context not only of his own gaze, but also uh, in the ways that he, he uh, uses these to draw the attention um, uh, of his colleagues to particular features um, of what he's seeing in the context of his talk. So there's again, there's a very close uh, kind of choreographed timing of those, those activities, which only comes with this hands-on um, control enabled through the, through the gesture system. And a second issue I want to talk about is really the, the, the um, tracking, uh, using Connect uh, to track the body um, at the patient table is actually pretty um, challenging. So you can see here from the Im image that the, the surgical team work very um, closely together. They're all similarly uh, dressed in sort of slightly baggy baggy clothing, um, so the bodies are not um, hugely well defined. Um, and, and, and the issue here is really, um, when we think about uh, gesture technology, it's not simply a question of the, the, the machine seeing uh, what you're doing. There's an active um, uh, performance of the gesture in, order, in, in such a way as to make yourself sensible um, to uh, the system. So. What was, in, what was important here in order to allow people to uh, um, change their body or perform uh, in particular ways to make themselves sensible is we also have this picture-in-picture uh, -picture, uh, um, on, on, the, on the display uh, to present back what, what the, um, the system is seeing and, what, and how it's interpreting the, the, the body so that the surgeon and the surgical team can adjust their actions in, or, in order to make it um, sensible to the system. So here you can see some of the challenges in, in this right-hand picture. This is, this is a blown-up version of the, the picture-in-picture. Picture. Some of the challenges here are because they're working in close proximity is that the, the Connect system is interpreting um, the, the body of the colleague as belonging to um, the body of this, this um, surgeon in, in the front here. So by presenting that back, they can uh, make adjustments in order to make themselves uh, sensed. Now the issue here is not, this is not just um, uh, an individual concern, actually it becomes uh, a, a much more collaborative concern in the way that they, they kind of um, configure themselves. It's something that the whole team uh, needs to learn and accommodate. So what we, what we see here is how um, this, put, this person in the background here um, uh, has come into view the images and consult with the, the two surgeons in front. Um, but in doing so, uh, his body becomes implicated in what the what the um, system is seeing. So he actually interferes with it, uh, with with their ability to make themselves sensed. So here, the surgeon then asks him to can see that he's he's responsible for causing the the problems with the sensing. He asks them to to move out of the way, uh, and gradually over time, the the, the team um, learn to accommodate these things. That by looking at the picture in picture, they. Uh, they, they more um, proactively move themselves um, out of the way. They, they start um, using behaviours, for example, like hiding behind the surgeon when, they, when it's visibly apparent that they're interacting um, with the system. And this, things like the scrub nurses, people like the scrub nurses um, also begin to time their actions uh, so that they can see that someone is visibly engaging with the system. They time their actions so as not to interfere uh, with making that the person um, sensible by the system. So I'm going to move on now to a third context for which we might think about um, Nui, not as a uh, concern with the natural, but a concern with the, the social, and how we might uh, conceive of Nui, Nui of opening up new forms of social participation. 
The particular concern here is with what um, social scientists uh, refer to as com commensality, and this is essentially uh, a fancy word for uh, shared eating practice, this kind of the social and cultural aspects of shared um, eating uh, practices. When, they t when um, social scientists talk about commensality, they talk about um, uh, shared meal times in the home, not in terms of simple consumption practices, but really um, as a rich site for the construction of family and other relationships. So shared meals here, bringing people together, uh, family and friends, um, and it becomes an opportunity for communication, share and narrative exchange, uh, and, and various other kind of accounts of personal and shared sig significance. And people in these circumstances are enacting uh, particular kinds of social roles and relationships when they participate in these meals. It could be a simple family meal and, and you're enacting family relationships. It could be that you have a friend over and then you have a host-guest kind of relationship. There's a whole series of relationships that, that, that might be enacted and each of those um, uh, comes with particular norms and cultural norms um, associated with those things. One of the things that people do in order to enact those relationships is that, is that they um, orient to the particular material structure of these settings. So we can think, for example, about you know, normal, normal meals. If we compare something like a buffet versus a, a more formal host-enabled um, uh, meal, th those things come to represent different possibilities for the way that you're supposed to participate in the meal. So a buffet is a bit more here relaxed and open where, where um, everyone can just uh, participate um, simultaneously with a more formal formal meal where the host is kind of in control, they use the material arrangement to uh, enact that kind of formality where, where they're, they're, they're serving um, something up. Um, and when we can th think about these then, if we think about the how the material arrangements are used, we can, um, that allows us to rethink the ways that we might position technologies within, within uh, these contexts as affecting the, the material opportunities available to enact these particular relations. So I'm, I'm going to show you um, a, a technology that we, that we um, built for um, placing in a dining context, and I'm going to talk about some of the issues associated with that. Essentially, this system uh, uh, is designed as a table centerpiece. So it sits uh, in the middle of the table uh, while you're having a meal. It takes photos from um, the Facebook accounts of anyone who's a guest there. So a host will set up a Facebook group um, to which she invites uh, family members or, or people who are guests coming over for, for dinner. And then, and then the system draws system collates those as a, as a collection of photos and uh, draws on those in, and then presents them uh, in some sort of semi-randomized um, way during the context of the, of the meal. Now, th there's a number of features of, of this device which, uh, which are important for, for thinking about um, th this mealtime context and the opportunities it presents for, for participation. Firstly, it's kind of, it's kind of an all-around um, device in terms of its visibility, so the screen's all the way around um, these things. The interaction possibilities are also uh, about uh, creating access control um, all around, so it's not about privileging um, a particular individual, it's about opening those up to everyone who's gathered around the table. So there's two key, key interaction mechanisms here. The top one, which is, uh, you saw, you just, you just um, it's, a kind of a, it's a tangible way of just uh, flicking through the different collections. So at, when you spin that, it goes on to a different uh, person's uh, photo collection. Uh, 
the, the, the second interaction mechanism is uh, essentially a proximity sensor. So it's a simple um, touchless gesture which uh, stops, stops the, um, the, the photo stream going around and zooms in on a particular photo. So, so, the, so if it's that photo, for example, and you uh, interact with the mechanism, that photo then gets zoomed in and uh, presented on all the displays rather than a single stream um, going around. But this arrangement has particular uh, important consequences for then how interactions with the technology can be appropriated um, in the course of all sorts of relationships during the, the, the mealtime. So it's designed for collective participation rather than privileging control with the individual. So I'll just show you a video of it in use. So the, the, I mean, the important thing about this uh, system uh, and its content is not um, it's not designed to animate the social. So the photographs there are, are not uh, a way of making people talk about things uh, as though they wouldn't have anything else to, to, to talk about. So that's not the, that's not the point. Um, so the, the point is that by opening up um, possibilities for interactions with the display and the photos, it, it, it provides the diners with a particular resource um, in which different facets of these social relations can be uh, uh, enabled and played out in uh, socially appropriate ways. So the interaction mechanisms here um, it, it can be used as a as a social um, a social gesture, if you like, so that they, for example, if you if you um, use that gesture to zoom in on a particular display, that might be expressing interest or inviting others to to participate uh, in the conversation. So it's in the timing of these interactions, not their not necessarily their naturalness, in their timing uh, and their relationship to particular bits of content. Um, uh, and the combination with conversation where their significance becomes um, apparent. So what, what these kind of interactions en enable is they allow you to, for example, um, uh, control your, your uh, turn taking within, within a conversation. They also provide um, safe ways of introducing topics, safe ways of uh, complimenting or asking questions about the, the, the content or raise, raising the profile of a particular photo as a, as a topic um, a, of interest. Now, the, the, other, the other interesting thing, I, uh, I think, is to think about the, the meal time as a trajectory of activities that so it, it evolves over the course of a, of a period of time, and it requires particular work to make it um, run smoothly. Okay, so the way the way is also that that, that um, the meal is uh, conducted is also done with particular uh, sensitivity to, to social relations. So that you know the timing of a host offering you a, a particular dish, for example, has particular social implications relating to the uh, the particular kind of relationships that are being that are being enacted there. Now. Some, so some examples of, of how this might be play, play out is that the host, for example, might get up to go and get the pudding in the context of a meal. Uh, there's other examples where um, children upstairs are, are getting out of bed, so the host has to, to get up and leave to go and, and deal with these things. So there's all, all sorts of things where people are drawn away from um, the, the conversation and the social activities of, of the meal time. Now, one of the, one of the things that that uh, this system is doing is not just enabling shared control um, and shared participation, but it's also, by doing that, it's also um, sharing the responsibility um, for, uh, um, for, for the conversation and for the talk around uh, these devices. So if you think about a normal, uh, present, you know, talking about photos over a laptop where an individual is controlling uh, those things, there's a particular uh, responsibility for the person controlling the system to then to, to uh, continue the conversation through through those mechanisms. Well, by distributing, by allowing this access all the way around, you distribute not just control but res uh, responsibility for these things. So the fact that getting up from a meal to go and attend to your kids upstairs actually um, 
it's not as socially it's socially prob problematic. It's, it, um, you, you have less accountability to, to stay involved in, in that conversation because other people can then, then take responsibility for, for the presenter role or for, for continuing the conversation through the media presented on these um, displays. So just to conclude then, um, what, what I'm trying to show through these examples and, and some conversations that, that we're having with Frank and Bernd in, in, in trying to set up the, the social Newey Centre is really uh, a different way of thinking about um, natural, user natural user interfaces. Um, so far in the literature, a lot of the discussion is really around uh, preoccupation with whether these things are natural or intuitive or not, and that, that frames um, the, the kind of directions that we might take with, with te particular technologies, it frames the way that we evaluate these things, it frames the way that we design um, for these things. So what we're trying to do, I think, is try to reframe new as a social concern. And so from this perspective, then, these technologies um, can be viewed more in terms of the opportunities that they, they present for social uh, interaction and how we orient these um, opportunities to enact particular kinds of relationships and create meaning in the context of everyday practice. So social new here is not simply a question of multi-person uh, newy, although we can, uh, that would also uh, fit in, but it's more about uh, an analytic orientation that takes into account um, the social significance of these interactive properties in particular context of practice. The issue here is not simply uh, as a means to enhance our understanding, but actually I think by, by taking this perspective, I think it reorients the way that we approach the design um, of these technologies. It offers us the possibility to reimagine re um, our social practices through, through um, the opportunities of these technologies. And, uh, to reimagine the ways that we might enact social um, uh, relations uh, in interesting new ways. I'm going to wrap up there. Go, let's bang on time. Good. use both quantitative and qualitative uh, uh, measures in order to, to, to deal with these things and, and, and those things would, would work within th th this particular framing. Now, there are of course challenges with quantitative stuff in terms of um, you know, how, do, how, how do you measure uh, the goodness of a social interaction? It's kind of a, a, a little bit um, intangible as, as something that, 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 you, that you can measure. Of course people have techniques for doing that, whether they're valid and reliable I think we, you know, we would have some question um, with that. So I don't think I don't think this particular uh, orientation um, says you can't quantitatively uh, do this by, for example, um, classifying particular behaviours, counting the number of actions, or whatever. I mean, I, it depends what's your bag in terms of um, uh, methodological orientation. Uh, we tend to favour the, the kind of qualitative. Uh, close inspection of, of, of videos, ethnographic uh, kind of orientations towards these things. But typically, these things are judged in terms of efficiency, you know, measuring things like time saving. And I think we want, I think, th this particular orientation, we want to kind of get away from those. That's not to say you can't quantitatively try and measure some aspect of social um, behaviour. I was interested in your view of social semiotics and then multimodal analysis. Have you explored that angle much? Uh, social semiotics, this type of thing. Explain. Uh, what I'm doing right now is a socially, it's socially embodied and it's a social semiotic. It means something to the people in this room. My accent has certain meaning to this room. So it's a semiotic, the symbol, study of symbol systems. So I was interested in what you're doing with symbol systems and, and maybe it's an avenue for you to research this. Social semiotics and then multimodal analysis uh, in conjunction with social semiotics, because uh, 
and from languages so see language as a social center. Yeah, I, th I mean, I, th I think if you get, get back to the surgery setting, well, all these settings actually, I mean, I think it, it looks at the ways that we combine um, uh, gesture and talk and our other bodily orientations. I'm just suggesting that maybe you can use that, that body of literature to inform your work. That's what I'm suggesting. I'm not, in a sense, I'm just trying to put it out there. So, so look at the literature in social semiotics, multimodality, multimodality, okay. all those kind of systems, symbols. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> Great. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. That was very interesting. And I'm just thinking about these examples here, these are people who, who know each other well, family groups and close colleagues and so on. And I'm wondering what happens when the, the social well, when the Nui becomes used among strangers. So voice and sound, for example, is kind of inherently public. And so when you're on a bus you can hear people's intimate conversations through mobile phones and so on. Does the gesture and the other natural user interface do interesting things when people are using these in public. I think so. When, when I talk about social, I, I mean all the, mean all those things. So I'm not necessarily talking about social as a the kind of you know close hugginess and and the, the niceties of, of family or social relations. I think all all sorts of social relationships get play, get played out there, and some of those involve, for example, um, distancing yourselves from from people and and using. Uh, the, the, the properties of these systems to, to do those things. So we've, we've done a number of things with with um, public displays, for example, in, in public settings. And I think there's, there's definitely ways that, that because you're interacting in conjunction with strangers, that, that you think about the, the <coughs> design of the new in particular, particular ways that al allows people to enact those, say, social distances or the fact that you might be um, less comfortable in those surroundings in, in, in performing certain kinds of uh, actions, whether, you know, whether they're large gestures, whether it's vocalizations of some sort. So, it, it, I mean, this, this, this analytic orientation very much takes those different possibilities into account. It's just a, a different set of social relations uh, being acted out. So I think, I mean, it's a good point here that, that because of the term social, I think sometimes it, it, it tends to think about how, the, the ways that we might um, Collaborate or have fun together, and it's not, it's absolutely not about that. It's just it's a social uh, orientation towards these things and all um, the possible kind of relationships that we might want to enact through those. Sure. Yeah. Um, thanks, Kenton. I just wanted to ask about the, the table photo device. I'm still trying to understand how it's not about just giving people something to talk about. And I'm, I'm a bit intrigued about why it's descri described as a safe platform, because to me it actually has quite a few potential risks. It, did, it, it just happens, I don't know. So, uh, when I say it's a safe way of, of introducing topics, it's a, so that refers back to Harvey Sachs' work, which, which talks about the way that we appropriate various things in our environment in order to um, raise certain raise certain topics of conversation. So if I, if I just ask out of the blue something about, something about uh, your family, um, I'm, not really, I'm not really making myself accountable. I'm not really um, giving myself or giving you a reason for why I might uh, ask those things. So the point about these resources is that, is that they, they offer accountable ways of um, introducing uh, topics or complementing. I can't, you know, it, 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 it's the, the social nuance of, say, complimenting um, a person in a, in a way that doesn't uh, imply yeah. something, right, is, is, is quite a delicate one. And, and that's how we, or, or criticizing someone, for example, again, a delicate thing. And, and we, we use um, various things that we can all see in the environment in order to, to, to bring those topics in in a way that's socially acceptable. So that's that's what that, that means. It's not saying the technology is safe. I'm saying that people use use the, the, the content, as in the photos, and the timings of those interactions in order to um, make their make their inquisitions or. Uh, so it's a way of giving permission. People use people use that as a way of taking permission in turn taking. Yeah. Right? I'm just imagining some significant life event comes up on a photo and nobody. It. And then the first. Yeah, no, of course, I mean, I mean, they, they, in a longer talk, I, you, can, you know, we can talk about the, those things. It's, it's, all those things can come up. So, how you know, how would you all, 
awkwardly deal with that. Well, it's more of a comment, and I, I, I really enjoyed the talk also because it, it highlights that the social new is that the social in the new is not that is, social is not necessarily the new. So that food for talk system is a very social system, but both the brain computing is a very intimate technology as well as the interaction with the display in a certain operating theory. So, uh, an individual technology, but the way you frame it makes it social, and I think that's. Thank you so much. Isn't that a lovely way to me? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>